Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison, uh, President of Chiropractic Biophysics Seminars and Technique, and also President of Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit, our Spine Research Foundation. Uh, this week we're going to go through uh, video research review number 46. Uh, this project actually just hit PubMed in terms of the abstract uh, just this month. Uh, it says it was uh, in uh, 2016, but it actually just became available uh, this month, 2017, from the Journal of Back Musculoskeletal and Rehabilitation. Uh, the title of this project is, Does Rehabilitation of the Cervical Lordosis Influence Sagittal Cervical Spine Flexion Extension Kinematics in Cervical Spondylotic Radiculopathy Subjects? Uh, by my colleagues, Ibrahim Mustafa, Aliyah Mohammed Dieb and myself, Deed Harrison. Uh, my colleagues from Cairo, Egypt, uh, were really the uh, spearheaders of this particular project. And this is uh, part of Professor Ibrahim's, uh, uh, basically his uh, PhD uh, dissertation project at Cairo University. Uh, this is a brief report that describes part of, uh, or part of the findings from a, a randomized trial that uh, we performed jointly. Uh, background. The cervical spine flexion and extension movements, or what we call kinematics, are very important to the health and well-being of a person. Number one, proper motion drives joint uh, lubrication. It improves joint health. It also inhibits pain and muscle spasms that somebody may be having. Uh, proper movement is important for all aspects of what we do in our day-to-day -day activities. Quite frankly, if you can't move right, you're going to compensate in other areas and your spine begins to break down. You'll get degenerative changes, you'll get muscle problems, you get pain, you get headaches, etc. So normal movement is very important. Uh, the problem is that there's a large uh, discrepancy or debate, if you will, on what constitutes proper flexion and extension or forward and backwards movement patterns in the cervical spine. This particular project is not designed to answer that particular question, what is normal healthy motion? This project looks at abnormal motion in a defined population, which seems counterintuitive. If you don't define normal, what is abnormal? Well, we do know that there are limitations in terms of when a person is dis described as lack of mobility what is not enough, but the exactness of what a healthy movement for a normal aged and sexed person, that's debatable. Uh, so this project takes a look at uh, abnormal movement patterns in the cervical spine in terms of decreased mobility in a neck pain population. Uh, so we do know that there is a difference in neck pain versus no normal subjects in terms of their range of motion. So this project's going to look at a defined population with loss of, of movement and also a condition. And then we're gonna to try to rehabilitate something specific in this population and see if that improves flexion extension kinematics. Now to give you a background on what we're t attempting to improve, it is loss of the cervical lordosis. Many studies have identified that abnormal cervical curves predispose or predict altered movement patterns in uh, a given population of people. For example, this paper came out in 2002 in the journal Spine. They took five groups of subjects with neck pain. Now all these subjects have neck pain, five groups. Lordotic necks, straight necks, kyphotic necks, S curves with reversals down low and S curves with reversal up high. Now what they did is they matched these five groups for appropriate variables, age, weight, height, sex, and pain, because those are the variables known to determine or dictate in part cervical movement patterns in forward and backwards bending called flexion extension. Now what these authors determined for one of the, the first times in a properly designed study is that the alignment of the cervical curve in its starting position on an x-ray, meaning what your neck curve looks like in a neutral lateral curve, that determined the flexion and extension movement patterns at end range of motion. So the authors concluded, alterations in static alignment of the cervical curve causes alteration in dynamic kinematics of the cervical spine during flexion extension as measured on end range of motion flexion extension radiographs.
Similarly, a paper came out in 2010 out of the journal Manual Therapy. These guys identified that the initial posture of the cervical spine, whether it's forward or backwards translation or loss of the curve in different areas, will determine what type of movement patterns are present on cervical flexion and extension. Now these authors used young healthy individuals. So here's what they identified. Subjects with forward head translation had different movement patterns than subjects with backwards head translation. And part of that is due to the change in the cervical curve that happens with these two postures. When your head's forward, you tend to get a straightening in the mid and lower cervical spine. When your head's backwards, you tend to get a, a straightening in the upper cervical spine. So those two projects nicely I indicate that alignment in the sagittal plane dictates movement patterns in the cervical spine. And then lastly, a project came out in 2008 in spine that looked at flexion and extension movements in the cervical spine as determined by alignment and degenerative joint disease. Now this study is uh, quite nice because it used MRIs and what they identified is number one, if you have more degenerative joint disease in your cervical spine, that is going to alter movement patterns. Number two, the alignment of the cervical spine is related to the amount of degenerative joint disease you have. Now this scale from zero to five is a grade of the severity of disc degeneration or disc deterioration. Zero means none whatsoever and five is severely damaged joints or discs, right? So here's what these authors identified if they break or they broke down their subjects into different types of curves. Kyphotic necks are up here in the diamonds. Straight necks are with the X. Hypolordotic necks are with the triangles. Normal necks are with the circles. And then hyperlordotic necks are these nice squares. Now of note, the group that has the greatest severity of disc degeneration is cervical kyphosis, followed by straight neck. So if you look at this, kyphotic necks or the altered alignment of the cervical curve is correlated to the amount of disc deterioration. That was a finding in this particular project. Important to our project here that we're reviewing is the fact that each of these different neck curves was related to the type of movement that occurred on flexion and extension, both rotations and translations at the different levels in the cervical spine. So we know this, let me give you a little background for those of you that may not uh, understand what a, a, a healthcare provider understands. There's two types of movements in the, in the spine and actually in any object in the universe. There's rotations or angular movements and then there are translation or linear movements. Now there is a third type that we don't really want to talk about, it's complicated, it's called deformation or change in shape and size. What we're interested in in these projects is how the spine rotates and or translates under flexion and extension movement as may be caused or determined by the alignment of the cervical spine. So this project or this particular graph shows millimeters of translation, linear movement, at the different levels in the cervical spine, C2, C3, C3, C4, C4, C5, 5, 6, and then the very bottom of the neck, 6 and 7. And what you'll notice right away, kyphotic necks have different movements as compared to the rest of the cervical spine at different levels. You'll see that that changes when I jump to here, hyperlordotic necks change in the lower cervical spine, whereas in the mid cervical spine where most of the degeneration occurs, kyphotic necks are associated with a greater amount of translation that approaches statistical significance. Now when I jump to the rotations in degrees, you'll also see that there's a difference in these different types of neck curves. Specifically, kyphotic necks tend to have the greatest movement down at C6, C7. They tend to have the smallest movement in the upper cervical spine. So what we see is lack of mobility in one part of the spine and then increased mobility in another spot, uh, part of the spine in the cervical spine in this example is dictated by the alignment of the cervical lordosis.
This has relevance to A, how you move, and then B, how joints break down and wear down. Certainly there is increased mobility in, in uh, two or three of the joint levels in different types of shapes or different types of alignment in the cervical spine. Specifically, uh, too much curve also creates abnormal motion or increased motion uh, in the lower cervical spine, four, five, and five, and six. But specific to this uh, particular uh, presentation, we wanna kinda focus on loss of the cervical curve or kyphotic alignment as that is what we're going to be investigating. So studies show this. From the results of the present study, cervical surgery such as discectomy and fusion should attempt to restore the lordosis in the cervical sagittal plane to prevent degeneration and symptomatic deteriorations. Well, we're gonna apply that to non-surgical settings and we're gonna look at a conservative approach at rehabilitation of the cervical curve. Uh, to our knowledge, no study has done this to date. No study has taken a group of subjects that have loss of the cervical lordosis and consequent loss of cervical spine flexion extension kinematics and then tried to rehabilitate the cervical uh, curvature to see what happens to flexion and extension kinematics. So the current project, this study has actually uh, got two or three parts. Uh, what we're gonna do is take a sub part of the study and look at the kinematic results and I'll save some of the other results like nerve root function uh, for a later presentation. Uh, but this particular project, uh, we used 30 subjects with a lower cervical spine uh, spondylotic myelopathy. So C4, C5, C5, C6, or C6, C7. So they had degenerative joint disease and bone spurs down in that mid and lower cervical spine. Uh, the 30 subjects were randomized into one of two groups, 15 subjects in each group. One group got cervical spine uh, exercises and stretches and infrared, and then the other group got those same three things, uh, cervical spine exercises, stretches, and infrared, plus a new traction, we called it a new traction, to design or to rehabilitate the cervical curve. The traction's actually been around since the late 1980s. Uh, what we looked at is multiple outcomes. In this particular presentation, we're gonna show you uh, some of the pain outcomes, the curve outcomes, and the, the uh, cervical spine flexion and extension measurement. So here's what we did. We did three-point bending or what we call two-way cervical spine traction in the treatment group or what you would call the experimental group designed to improve the cervical curve. This two-way traction we pull at the apex of the curve, specifically in these subjects down in the lower cervical spine, and then we also have a higher back pull. We cannot have a lot of extension in the back pull in these subjects due to the fact that they have so much degenerative joint disease, they have neck and arm pain, so we can't do a lot of backwards bending. So what we're going to do is pull at the apex of their cervical spine at a low angle in the front, and then we'll have a high angle in the back. Now, the process to getting somebody in this, you don't start on day one and, and throw them in with a lot of weight. You've gotta see how much weight they can tolerate. Typically, we start at 15 pounds on the front pole. We start at three to five minutes, and then over consecutive visits, three times a week for 10 weeks, we're gonna increase the amount of weight, and then we're gonna increase the amount of time that they do to where we're, we're hoping to get the subjects between 10 and 20 minutes. 20 minutes is more effective, 10 minutes is minimum. So we start at three minutes, we build up consecutive days, a few minutes each time to where the subject's able to do 10 to 20 minutes and we wanna get the person to at least 25 pounds on the front of their neck or roughly, roughly about 12 kilograms, okay? At the end of 30 visits, we then reevaluate uh, cervical spine radiographs for flexion and extension movement, the uh, cervical curve on a neutral, and also we're going to be assessing neck pain and things like that. Uh, we included subjects that had loss of their cervical curve defined by uh, the uh, C2 to C7 posterior body tangent method. Subjects had to be under 25 degrees for that uh, measurement method. They also had to have head translation that was greater than 15 millimeters. Now, for cervical spine movement, there's multiple ways that we can look at flexion and extension in the cervical spine. 
We did not do what's shown here. Uh, posterior body tangents, we really like those in chiropractic biophysics technique. We know that those are reliable and valid representations, but we did not do that in the current project. I'll show you what we did in the current project. Uh, we actually used a method of Frobin from 2002 in the journal Clinical Biomechanics. We could have used this, but we elected not to. Uh, that's the posterior body tangent method. The method of Frobin is essentially a modification of the Cobb angle. Now here's the Cobb angle showing in plate lines at each vertebral level and then the intersection of those two lines shows us how much angulation there is between those levels. So you take a neutral, you go in range of extension and then in range of flexion and you can see the difference at in range of extension to in range of flexion between these angles. Well the method of Frobin what we do is you find the geometric center of the vertebral body and you have a plane through the, the middle of the vertebral body not the in plate. So the method of Frobin takes a plane through the uh, vertebral body and then it takes these lines and it does the same thing looking at flexion and extension movements. So essentially you could call the method of Frobin a modification of uh, in plate lines or cross sectional attempts through the curve. In fact, the method of Frobin is a little bit better than the Cobb angle because it's not determined by the uh, angle of the in plate relative to the back of the vertebral body. So using a, a mid-body bisector is uh, a little bit better in my opinion, even though classically it's not, in my opinion, quite as good as the poster body tangents because it is a cross section through a curved column. And we know from calculus, if you want to look at the slope of a curved column, you take the first derivative of that uh, column at that point. So, you know, technically you would say that this is kind of, a, uh, in my opinion, a generic way to assess the curve, but that's a side tangent. Only engineers and mathematicians understand what in the hell I just said. Uh, back to this. Uh, the uh, method of Frobin, the problem when we look at uh, translations, the, the measurement of translation is not a metric or linear measure, measurement, it's a quotient. So it's very difficult to understand the quotient as a measurement of overall vertebral body depth. So I'm, I'm gonna skip that method. And it, we just reported it that way to have standardization from subject to subject and level to level so it accounts for magnification. Uh, so the translations I'm going to show you, if you know anything about spine movement in the literature, you can't really use these to talk about instability because it is a non-metric uh, measurement. It's simply a percentage. Uh, so back to uh, the study. So in the group that got traction as part of the intervention, we noted statistically significant increases in the cervical curve. And I'll show you a table of this. We, we averaged approximately seven degrees of improvement in the cervical lordosis. In the non-traction group, exercise and stretching in infrared, there is no change in the cervical curve. Now that's to be expected. Now some of you that might shock because you believe that the cervical curve can be improved with you know standard generic PT you know, stretches, exercise, and infrared. But the fact of the matter is, multiple projects show that there's no change in the cervical lordosis following that. We have to do traction. These results show that as well. We also found improvement in pain, but the big one in this particular project is improvement in flexion and extension, translation, and rotation kinematics. We then followed these subjects for a minimum of three months and uh, we identified that those results were stable. So here's the cervical curve measurements between the two groups. Study and control, the average was 14 degrees of the cervical curve C2 to C7. After treatment, in the experimental group that got traction, these subjects jumped up to about 21 degrees. In other words, it's almost a seven degree change and that's statistically significant. In contrast, the control group shows zero change. What that means is you can x-ray a person the same from time A to time B and you're not going to get a difference driven by generic treatment. If it's not treatment designed to improve the curve, it's not gonna make a change. So this shows stability of the curve over time in the control group. Also, it shows stability of the measurement method 
and stability of the ability of the examiner to repeat the radiograph in the same manner. In other words, it's not just going to change on its own like some of you may be taught at certain, I won't say it, but chiropractic radiology departments, for example. Right? Back in the day when I went to college, there were several instructors that would make claims that were actually false. They would say that you can't measure an x-ray reliably. You can't position a subject accurately from session A to session B. Well, guess what we found? You can. It's time to make a change. Right? And by change, I, I don't mean you know the pun intended with the cervical curve. I mean make a change in the way we teach. Then stop care 30 visits later and reevaluate, or excuse me, stop care and, and uh, follow for three months with no care, reevaluate, and you'll notice most of the curve correction is stable in the treatment group that got traction. And again, the control group, guess what? No change over time. Their cervical curve dis did not change. Now I'm gonna skip the long-term follow-up because that's not relevant, like the, excuse me, the two-year follow-up in this particular data set. Uh, we did not do a two-year follow-up on the flexion extension movements. What we did is a three-month follow-up. Uh, but the entire project does have, in some of the outcome assessments, a two-year follow-up. But in this particular uh, Journal of Back Musculoskeletal Rehabilitation uh, project, we only did the three-month with flexion extension. So study and control group, you can see that they are chronic pain subjects, just over five at the beginning of the study. The traction improves the pain a little bit more than general PT at the end of 10 weeks, 30 visits later. And then three month follow up, uh, the traction group is a little bit better than when they stopped and the control group, their pain is going back to pre-study levels with no care. So three, month late, three months later, what's happening is the subjects are now becoming painful again. Why? Well, the cervical curve did not change. So then when you stop doing things, the PT, and you let the person go, pain comes back again, right? So the idea is if you want permanency in the improvement that you've attained, you actually have to make a change in the structure of the cervical spine and that's shown nicely here. Pre-study, 10 weeks later, 30 visits, stop care, follow them for three months and you'll see the study group is maintaining their improvement. Okay, now let's jump ahead to a couple sample x-rays. Pre post and follow up. And you'll notice I picked a very large change to show you. Uh, while we average seven degrees in the entire sample, some subjects change a lot more than other subjects. And what we need to do is we actually need to look at linear correlations between the amount of change in the cervical curve and the amount of improvement in the alignment of the cervical spine over time. And that's what we did in this particular project coming up. So does it, the question is, does the change in the cervical curve truly impact flexion extension movements? Well, here's what we found. This table is a little bit difficult to look at, so bear with me. This is for the rotations using the method of Froben. This is the C2 to C3 level. SG means study group. CG means control group. So pre is the amount of uh, total range of motion that they had at the beginning of the study. Now, eight degrees, the cervical spine at C2, C3 should move between 20 and 25 degrees in its total range of motion. Now, what you're seeing is roughly a third of that. That is very reduced in terms of the range of motion. Now, when we look at aftercare in the study group that got the traction, that is jumping up by about two, uh, two degrees. And then at three month follow up, it's mostly maintained. That P value is statistically significant. In contrast, you compare that to the control group. The control group actually loses a degree in their movement over the three month follow up. That is statistically significant. And there is a difference between the two groups. C3, C4, we can do the same thing. 12 degrees increases to 15 degrees following care, 14 degrees at three month follow up. In contrast, the control group that did not get traction, look, they're losing a degree in their range of motion. Okay, so you go down to all the levels, and I'm just gonna show you the three month follow up. This is the study group, this is the control group. You can see statistically significant differences at all these levels except 
we don't find a strong difference at the C6, C7 level between these subjects. The other levels though, we find that we see improvement in the cervical range of motion of two to four degrees following traction at each level, okay? And then the correlation coefficients, Pearson R, these values represent whether or not the change in cervical curve is correlated to the improvement in the cervical end range of motion. So this is for rotations versus the ARA. So the ARA is C2 to C7 total lordosis and the rotations are the amount of movement in the cervical spine at each level. Now the way it works is this is the entire sample at the beginning of the study. The entire sample. When I look at the magnitude of the cervical curve in all 30 subjects, does that correlate to the flexion, extension, rotational ranges of motion? The answer is yes at C2, C3. The answer is yes at C3, C4. C4, C5, yes. C5, C6, yes. C6, C7, yes. Boom, let's stop right there. Here's the deal. What we've identified is the cervical curve initially in a subject with pain, the initial presentation is linearly related to the magnitude of flexion and extension movement at every single joint in your cervical spine. That's what was identified in the previous projects I went through the three papers, but this one is better in terms of its actual correlations. We've identified that the alignment of the curve is initially correlated to your flexion and extension range of motion. That's extremely important. You got chiropractors and PTs and doctors out there saying, oh, the alignment of your neck doesn't matter at all to the way you move. And I go, what planet do you live on? Did you ever study kinematics? Did you ever understand how alignment dictates function? It's called statics and dynamics. It's like, oh my God, I can't even believe it's debatable. However, let me tone it down just a bit. We identified it in a project. We found that there's a correlation. Other studies have found that too. This one is a very robust, robust finding. Using the method of Frobin that's reliable and it's accurate for cervical movement, the alignment of your curve dictates the amount of movement. Now, what happens after care? This is after 30 visits. The study group noticed that they maintain this linear correlation. Notice what happens to the control group. It's gone. There is no correlation in the study group following care because the alignment did not change, their movement did not really change. So what this is finding is the improvement in the cervical curve in the study group linearly related to the improvement in the movement that was found after care in the traction group that got curve correction. And this was found at C3, C4, this was found at C4, C5, this was found at C5, C6, and it was also found at C6, C7, okay? So this is a big finding as well. The change in your cervical curve was linearly related to the change in the flexion and extension movement. When we improve your neck curve, it improves the way you move. It is statistically related and it's maintained at long-term follow-up. <clears throat> we found the same thing for translations. Even though this is more difficult to understand, you can just kind of look at this table. You can see the quotient, the non-metric quotient that we used from Frobin also shows the improvement in translational movement patterns at every joint is linearly related to the curve correction over time in the study group. It's also initially related in both groups to the pre-alignment value. So the way you translate forward and backwards when you flex and extend your, your cervical spine is related to the initial starting position of your neck curve. Very important finding, okay? Translational movements are important for the health of the joint. When I bend my head forward, the joints rotate but they also slide forward, okay? It's a healthy movement. If it doesn't do it enough, it's a problem. If it does it too much, it is also a problem. To our knowledge, this study is the first study to show that when you change the cervical curve, 
it improves flexion and extension kinematics in both rotations and translations. To our knowledge, this is the first study that, to truly show that there is an actual linear correlation between the initial alignment of your cervical curve and every joint flexion and extension in range of motion, rotation and translation kinematics. Likewise, this study is the first to show that when we improve the cervical curve, it is linearly related to rotation and translation kinematics as well from C2 to C7 as you flex and extend your neck. These changes were stable at three month follow up. Therefore, we believe that appropriate physical rehabilitation, meaning chiropractic, PT, physiotherapy, should improve or should try to improve the cervical lordosis in subjects that have neck pain and cervical spondylotic radiculopathy as this likely improves the patient outcomes specifically at long-term follow-up. Hopefully I didn't yell at you too much there but I've got a little excited about this. We know this, spine movement is life. If you can improve motion, you're going to improve a lot of things in somebody's health and well-being. Also, if you think about it, the movement wasn't even normalized per se in these subjects just due to the amount of damage that they had in their cervical spine. Future studies need to look at this and go, how far can we take this increase in motion by continuing to improve the cervical curve in subjects that have de uh, degenerative joint disease? And also, what's the effect in subjects that don't have degenerative joint disease, right? We know that even at, at the end of our project, 12 to 16 degrees of motion in the cervical spine is not necessarily what we'd call a normal range. We wanna see these subjects get into the 20 degree mark for total range of motion. Uh, until next time, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. Thank you for your time and attention.